from becoming a Catholic. Why can't women become priests? 1 800 585 9396. What's stopping? I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1 800 585 9396. What's stopping? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? you, you, you. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome to Call to Communion. I am David Anders, your host. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the U.S. and Canada, dial 1-205-271-2985. You can send us an email at ctc at ewtn.com. The show is Called to Communion. All people are called to communion with Christ through the church that he founded, this church, this uh, show, excuse me, is particularly for non-Catholics who have not yet come into full communion with the Catholic Church, and we want to talk to you about why. Call us and tell us why you're not a Catholic, what's keeping you from becoming a Catholic at 1-800-585-9396. You might be a Catholic and you're in dialogue with a non-Catholic friend, a relative, co-worker, neighbor, and so forth. They may have put a question to you, a challenge to you about the Catholic faith, and you'd like some help answering it. If you call me up, I'll take a stab at it at 1-800-585-9396. Catholic Church is a beautiful place. Christ founded the church, Matthew 16, 18, on this rock. I'll build my church, he said. Ephesians chapter 3, St. Paul tells us God's plan was through the church to make known to the powers and principalities the wonderful mystery of salvation in Christ. Uh, G.K. Chesterton was once asked why he decided to become a Catholic. He said, well, the only reason worthwhile to get rid of my sins. The Catholic Church is the only church that claims to actually be able to get rid of our sins. A fellow called me last week and said, you know, we Protestants believe in salvation by faith alone, uh, just forgiveness and all it's taken care of, and you Catholics you know, add uh, love and ethics and morality to the picture. Isn't isn't ours better? Isn't it better news to be uh, to be left in sin and just forgiven? And I think, well, that's you know, absolutely not. What would you rather do? Avoid evil altogether, or commit evil and be forgiven and uh, forgiven it? And Catholic faith offers the possibility of forgiveness of sins, and then the grace to avoid sin in the future, growing ever more like God and Christ and holiness. That's the aim, the goal of the Catholic faith. And when we stumble and fall, which we do often in many ways, we have recourse to the sacrament of reconciliation to receive forgiveness of sins and more grace and strength to pick ourselves back up and continue on the journey along with Christ, hopefully to a life of holiness and ultimately in heaven, the beatific vision. Uh, Why aren't you on that journey? If you're not part of the Catholic faith, call us and tell us about it at 1-800-585-9396. I want to take a brief email. This one is from Catherine. Catherine writes and says, Greetings, Dr. Anders. I was wondering if you could enlighten me about what happened between the Roman Catholic Church and a portion of the Anglican Episcopal Church in regard to some sort of reconciliation that may have taken place in the past couple of years or so. All I've been able to piece together is that a type of approval was given and a connection was put in place that allowed the converts, if that's the correct word, to participate in Catholic life but still have some part of their previous Anglican traditions to remain. How much of this is true? Is this sort of thing open only to this denomination? If not, what are the conditions that have to exist for others to agree to this arrangement? All right, cordially, Catherine. Catherine, I know what you're talking about. You're making reference to the Anglican ordinariate that Pope Benedict established. This created a path for Anglican Christians to retain some part of their Anglican heritage, their patrimony, uh, the use of the you know elements of the Book and Common Prayer and Anglican worship, um, and yet to enter into full communion with the Catholic Church. It was a special arrangement only with uh, the Anglican communion. There, aren't, there are not similar arrangements with Lutherans or Presbyterians or Baptists or other Protestant denominations. Um, but uh, these churches that have come into full communion with the Catholic Church, they are now Catholic churches. They have ordained Catholic clergy. They, they serve uh, the Catholic Church. They're in communion with the Bishop of Rome. They're simply Catholic churches that express their Catholic faith and devotion drawing on some elements of the Anglican patrimony. So there may be one in your in your neighborhood. You can look them up online, probably, Anglican Ordinariate, and uh, find out if there's one near you. So thank you so much for the call, I mean, for the email. I appreciate it. All right, I want to take another quick email. We're screening some calls. If you want to be on the show, don't forget to call 1-800-585-9396, one 585 9396 
96. This one is from Bruce. Bruce writes and says, What was the Albigensian heresy and whatever became of those Albigensians? Well, the Albigensian heresy was a heresy uh, particularly strong in southern France in the High Middle Ages. Uh, they called themselves sometimes the Cathars, which meant the pure ones. And it was a dualistic sect. And like many dualistic sects, they held that the soul or the higher principle in man was uh, created by God and that the body, that the material element was evil, created by another God, that the aim of the spiritual life was to escape the bonds of the flesh. Uh, sometimes it took very extreme forms, so the Albigensians had as a kind of a, at the end of their life, they performed a ritual called the Consolatum, which is a form of ritual suicide. Um, and so uh, it was a, uh, 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 it was definitely an alternative to the Catholic faith, a heretical alternative, drew many people away from the Catholic Church in southern France, and, uh, and, uh, and called forth all the efforts of the Church and its apologetical resources uh, to combat the error. Uh, St. Dominic was uh, very well known for his, for his uh, preaching against the Albigensian heresy. St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, had it in mind when he was writing his great works. And eventually the Albigensian heresy passed away. Although elements of, of dualism, Gnosticism, this kind of tendency to view the body as an evil, uh, the soul is the only spiritual principle in man, continue to, to this day. And so we have to combat those because they, they deny the intrinsic goodness of the created world made by God. All right, when we come back from our quick break, we're going to go to Ken in Augusta, Georgia, Paul in Cincinnati, Cincinnati Ohio, and to you at 1-800-585-9396. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith, 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. It's the start of a new day for Morning Catholic Radio. I've been having this ongoing battle with a priest friend of mine who likes to barbecue and forbids women to come into the barbecue area. Oh. <laughs> he, he always says, he says, look, women have to cook every day, but men, when we cook, we are real chefs and gourmands. And I was like, what? Well, let me tell you, I thought I know who that priest is. <laughs> Morning Glory, Catholic from the start. Weekday mornings, 7 Eastern, on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. From across the globe, families come together. The Holy Father calls them the leaven of society. This week, EWTN invites your family to a history-making event, the first ever world meeting of families in the United States, including Pope Francis's first visit to America. The World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, September 22nd through the 25th on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Welcome back to Call to Communion. I'm your host, David Anders. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, dial one 205 271 2985. Call us and tell us why you're not a Catholic or what your obstacle or barrier to Catholic faith is or what your question is about the Catholic Church at 1-800-585-9396. I want to go now to Ken in Augusta, Georgia, listening on FM 91.1. Ken, welcome to Call to Communion. Hey, thank you. Um, I've just, I'm like, like I told the call screen, I'm just passing through Augusta, I just heard, so I gave it a try and I got, I got through. Fantastic. Uh, Welcome to the show. It, your question was, what's stopping me from being a Catholic? Uh, and as an, and I told him, I'm an ex-Catholic. 45 years, I left the church. I'm 62. I left the church 40 or so years ago. I guess for me, as a now, quote-unquote, born-again Protestant you know, believer, uh, would be defending all of the church's doctrines. I mean, there's a whole gamut. Uh, I mean, but I'm drawn back to the church because, I've, as I told the call screener, uh, Protestantism isn't, it, it's all over the place, too. And uh, so I've read a couple of couple of books. I've read Crossing the Tiber by uh, uh, Steve Ray, and then I've read The Protestant's Dilemma, and I can't think of the, the man's name that wrote that. Uh, and then I Devin, watched a lot Devin of Rose. stuff Devin on Rose, Devin Rose wrote that. 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. De- Devin Rose wrote the Protestant's dilemma, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's. The, I mean, and and then I like I told the cross grader, if you go to a Catholic church, and I've gone, I go from time to time, the, the local Catholic church, which is a huge church, Catholic church. Uh, no one, no one comes up to you and says, "Hey, I noticed you're new. Welcome to our church." Uh, like they would at a Prot- at most Protestant churches that I've ever been to. Uh, they'll come up to you and they'll try to, you know, they'll invite you to come back, to come to the the church social or whatever, the class. Uh, that hasn't happened to me. Of course, I, I get out of there as quick as I can because so I, <laughs> I feel uncomfortable because I feel like it's been so many years since I've been in a Catholic church that I've even forgotten, you know, some things. So okay. I, I guess the qu- the question is for for me is this, and I've watched some ap- apologetics on on, on YouTube, uh, and I, like I said, I've read some books, and I watch uh, the Journey Home, and I listen to those testimonies of different people. Is just what what's another good book to read? Uh, Steve Ray's book was good, and uh, for me, but. Uh, it's just kind of it's just coming back. It's just hard. I mean, I I don't know where to start. Sure, sure. Well, th- you've given me a lot to talk about. We've got a lot to discuss, and and let me just hit on a few points if I could. So, uh, let me go right to the question about the apparent lack of friendliness or lack of engagement that you experience if you walk into the typical Catholic parish, and uh, this is something that a lot of converts from Protestantism experience because in many Protestant communities, many congregations are really schooled on. You know, part of what we're about is is uh, engaging people in this way, reaching out, shaking hands, getting their name in a book, and you know, calling them during the week and so forth. And I'm sure Catholics could do a better job at that. And of course, but there's there are some historical and cultural reasons that help explain that. It's not that Catholics are intrinsically unfriendly. I mean, once you enter into the life of the Catholic parish and the church, you, you just find yourself overwhelmed with friends. I mean, I've got friends all over the Catholic world. I'm a convert to the Catholic Church. Didn't grow up as a Catholic. Um, but uh, but I had to go hunting and pecking a bit to find you know like-minded people with common interests and and so forth and uh, and now I, you know I've got more Catholic friends than I can than I can shake a stick at but the parish itself is not always set up to cater to that kind of uh, relationship building and there's a good reason for that that the the principal purpose of the parish and the liturgy in the mind of the church is to facilitate worship is to facilitate worship we come to the mass hopefully in an attitude of reverence. To, uh, to worship God, to make the offering of our own interior life along with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And, of course, if you, you, know, if you said you, were, you left the church 45 years ago, if you had an opportunity to celebrate the Mass in the, in the, in the, uh, the pre-Vatican II rite, you know that that element of sort of extreme uh, quiet and devotion and prayerfulness was of the very essence of the liturgy. And I think we've gotten away from that a little bit uh, in more recent years, and a lot of people trying to bring that back, which is not a direction headed towards, you know, more backslapping and handshaking, but even less, you know, as we try to recover something of that contemplative dimension of the liturgy. Um, so again, that's not because Catholics are intrinsically unfriendly, it's because they conceive of the Sunday liturgy in a different way for a different purpose. Now, you know, once you enter into the life of the church and you begin, you know, really living it vigorously, you begin to find those other people that you, you share that faith with. And the friendships come and they blossom and they grow and they're deep and they're profound, but they don't come exactly in the same way. I'd also like you to consider that in, in coming back to the church, you're not simply coming to to your local parish. You are, of course. You are, of course, coming to the parish, but you're joining yourself to the Church of the Ages. You know, the great cloud of witnesses that the book of Hebrews speaks about, the saints all down through the years. This is the church of which Paul speaks in Ephesians 3 when he says that that God's plan, who created all things, was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. The church is a, is a profound spiritual and mystical reality that transcends all of time and space. And when you become Catholic, in a sense, you're shaking hands with St. Francis of Assisi, St. Dominic, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, all the apostles, uh, uh, in a way that's, that's, uh, that's as intimate and profound, as, and perhaps even more so, than uh, than the hand that you're shaking next to you in the pew. I know. I mean, this is very much my experience of the mass, my experience of the Catholic faith as a convert. 
uh, you know, when I became Catholic, I, I wanted to join that church that was founded by Christ and to find myself in communion with all these great saints down through the ages to nurture and cultivate my interior life by that profound relationship, which goes so far beyond, you know, Thursday night potluck dinners. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with Thursday night potluck dinners. All right, so that's, I think, adjusting your attitude to that, th- to that point of view it would help overcome a little bit that sense of unfulfilled expectation, walking in and expecting something and then not finding it. Rather, open yourself up to the, the more profound reality that the church is inviting you to participate in. So that, that's one point of reference. Now, you ask about further books to read. Um, I don't know if you've taken a look at Scott Hahn's book, uh, Rome Sweet Home, where he talks about his conversion to the Catholic faith uh, from Presbyterianism. And I'd also invite you to check out our, our webpage, calledtocommunion.com, where you'll find a number of people who were Protestants who have come into full communion with the Catholic Church and now are engaged in what we hope is a charitable dialogue between Catholics and non-Catholics, seeking to answer just the kind of questions that you've raised to form friendships and relationships and to overcome barriers to full communion. So if you would check out calledtocommunion.com, perhaps also the works of Dr. Scott Hahn, and then you can always shoot me an email privately offline if you want to uh, go to my own webpage, which is Calvin to Catholic. Dot com. I'd be happy to talk to you. So I appreciate the call. I hope that's helpful to you, and I really encourage you to continue in your journey. The easy thing, I, I, I want to leave you without this thought, and you said, what's the next step? Well, the easiest way to actually come back into communion with the church is simply, in your case, just to go to confession. Lay all this out in front of the priest, receive that absolution from sin, and be received back into, into fellowship with the church. It's easy as one afternoon with, uh, at your local parish. So don't, don't forget to take that step. And thank you so much for calling. I appreciate it. All right, the number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. I want to go now to Paul in Cincinnati, Ohio, listening on Sacred Heart Radio, AM 740. Paul, welcome to Call to Communion. Yes, uh, I enjoy the show very much. I appreciate it. Very much. Thank you so much. I want to ask, what's the difference between doctrine and dogma? And if you could give one or two examples of each to help illustrate the difference. But also, David, um, unrelated, a couple of days ago on the show, you made a reference to a book, Walk Through Darkness or something like that. Oh, yes. Author about wandering you know, in how darkness. God brings good out of evil. Yes. I was trying to find it. And Okay, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, that, that particular title is Wandering in Darkness, Wandering in Darkness, by Eleanor Stump. And um, as I mentioned to the, to the previous caller when I made that recommendation, it is, a, it is a thick and heady treatise. It's a philosophical work of several hundred pages. It's very deep. It's very profound. Uh, but I've, if you're willing to make the investment of time and intellectual effort, I think it's one of the best reflections on the problem of, of human suffering and the answer that Catholic faith gives. So it's a magnificent work, but it is challenging, I'll tell you in advance. It's a challenging work. It's called Wandering in Darkness by Eleanor Stump. Now, uh, it, with regard to your, to, your, um, uh, to your first question about the difference between doctrine and dogma, a dogma is a teaching of the Catholic faith that has been promulgated in a solemn way, like by a, by a conciliar pronouncement or by uh, an infallible pronouncement by the Pope, by the extraordinary magisterium. And sort of the paradigm example of this would be the dogma of the Trinity, right, which, we, which was taught uh, definitively at the Council of Nicaea and again in Constantinople, and it has been reaffirmed, reaffirmed over and over again in so many councils in so many ways. So a very solemn pronouncement of a teaching of the Catholic faith. A doctrine of the faith is, uh, is something that's held by the faithful, but it hasn't, and it's taught by the church, but it hasn't been uh, raised to the level of a, of a solemn magisterial pronouncement by, you know, by a council or by a pope. Um, you know, a, uh, and they can be taught infallibly. I mean, a doctrine can be infallible without having been promulgated as a dogma. Um, so that would be the case anytime you have a teaching of the faith that is held by the universal consent of the church everywhere, always and by all, uh, you know, by the Catholic consensus of the church and the bishops, the teaching authorities of the church down through the ages, even though it hasn't ri- been uh, raised to the, to the level of a dogma. And, I, you know, one example might be the, uh, the doctrine on the male-only priesthood. 
something that's been that's been infallibly taught over and over and over and over and over again for 2,000 years, the whole canonical tradition of the church, her disciplinary history, uh, her theology, the priesthood, her, her juridical practice, her sacramental practice, everywhere and always uh, reaffirms and confirms and assumes the, the male-only priesthood, but there's never been a council or a dogmatic declaration, infallible declaration by a pope, raising it to the level of a dogma. John Paul II came very, very close. He came up within a hair's breadth of making it a, of, of a dogma uh, in, his, uh, in his letter, the um, uh, uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. Uh, but it is an infallible doctrine taught by the church. So that's, that's the distinction. I hope that's helpful to you. All right, thanks so much for calling. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, dial one 271 2985 I want to go now to Jim in Hamilton, Ohio, listening on FM 89.5. Jim, welcome to Call to Communion. How are you doing? Hey, Jim, I'm doing great. How about you? Oh, fine. That's good. What can I do for you? Okay, why don't I know some? How come um, the Catholic Church can change the rules, the Pope can, but, um, you know, it's not not a Bible and I got, and that's why other churches protest with you, basically, because you cha- they change rules because they wanted to, not because, because they say it was inspired by God, or, you know, but how do we know? How do we know? It's just his word against ours. Okay, it's a great question, Jim. So let's let me draw a couple of distinctions, if I might. So, first of all, the Catholic Church has no power and claims no power to change the moral demands that that God makes on the human person by our very nature. So, you know, for instance, we know that murder is a grave evil, uh, the adultery is a grave evil, theft, lying, bearing false witness, these kinds of things are grave moral evils inscribed in our very nature by God. The Catholic Church has no power to change those. The Church can't come by and say, well, you know, murder was wrong yesterday, but it's okay today. We can't do that, because murder is intrinsically wrong. God made us in such a fashion that the human person is is sublime and, and has a dignity inherent in his very nature that can't be violated. So there's nothing the Church can do that can change reality, all right? The Church can't change reality. It just teaches truth, all right? So we can't change the moral law at all. Now, the Church also... Uh, legislates positive laws for the government of her own society, all right, in very much the same way that the that the secular government might lay down a, a, a law like, say, the speed limit, all right. Now, there's nothing inherent to the natural law that says the speed limit has to be 55 miles an hour instead of, you know, 54 or 56. Uh, arriving at 55 is just an arbitrary convention for the sake of convenience, because to regulate public order, it's a good idea for the government to, to, to regulate uh, uh, automobile traffic. And people go too fast, they're going to get hurt. It's sensible, it's logical, but there's nothing about 55 miles an hour that's written into the very fabric of nature uh, that would prevent the government from changing that to 54 miles an hour without doing some grave injustice. Well, in the same way, the church has laws to govern her own society, and these are called canon laws, all right? Um, and, uh, and any society has to have principles that govern her, her operations. Even, a, even the smallest Baptist church may have, uh, has laws that govern its own internal operations. They may not be written down. They may just be uh, conventions or traditions that are followed, like, you know, voting by a show of hands or voting by a secret ballot on a, on a piece of paper in a ballot box. Uh, those things aren't written in stone into the natural law, but for the sake of public decency and order, everybody in the community uh, follows those rules in order to in order to organize their own society. Well, the Catholic Church is a massive society, contains over a billion people in the world. It's got a 2,000-year history. And so in organizing her own internal operations, it makes perfect sense that she would have rules, that she would have laws that would govern things like Okay, how are the sacraments administered and where, and who can, who can administer the sacraments? Um, how are disputes between Catholics to be resolved? What if there's a complaint made by one uh, cleric against another? What if uh, somebody thinks they were treated unjustly by their bishop? I mean, you can just think of the thousands and thousands of cases that would call for some rules to adjudicate those. But many times, the laws that are laid down, like the speed limit law, they're, they're grounded in good sense and logic, uh, but the the rule itself may not reflect something absolutely necessary, you know, because of the natural law, and those things can be changed 
but the fundamental moral laws of God, they can never be changed. All right, I hope that's helpful to you. Please call back anytime, and after the break, I'll take your calls at 1-800-585-9396. one 585 9396 I put you on in the morning, and it's like having a friend talk to me during the day, and it refreshes my spirit so I can go about the business of doing my vocation of taking care of my family. If you have a comment about our programming, we'd love to hear from you, too. Call 205-795-5773, or send us an email to radio at EWTN.com. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. Hi, I'm Kathy Sinnott, and I'm host of EWTN's Celtic Connections. From our studios in Ireland, we take a Catholic look at the big stories breaking in Great Britain, in Ireland, and across Europe. Celtic Connections is the only Catholic news show made in the UK or Ireland. So join me every Saturday and Sunday on Celtic Connections. For dates and times in your area, log on to EWTN.com. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 1-800-585-9396 If it's happening at the Vatican, the United States, or anywhere else in the world, look to EWTN News for live coverage of landmark events in the life of the Church. From today's headlines to compelling interviews with Catholic newsmakers, EWTN News, only on the Global Catholic Network. I have a new love and respect for the Catholic Church, and those of you who waver in your faith, don't you dare. You stick to your guns, because that's the one thing you can hold on to. When everything else disappears around you, you say your rosary, you do what you guys do, but hang on to your faith, and don't you dare fall off the path. Stay on God's path, and listen daily to EWTN Radio. The prayer that I recommend to you is the Holy Rosary. I am carrying an assault weapon and a 50-round clip. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Welcome back to Call to Communion. I'm David Andrews, your host. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, dial 1-205-271-2985. The show is about... Barriers to full communion with the Catholic Church. If you're not a Catholic, you have some reason for not being a Catholic. It may be a strong theological objection. It may be a uh, a practical matter. You may have a relationship or a professional uh, relationship that impedes your ability to enter into full communion with the Catholic Church. It might be ignorance of Catholic teaching. It might just be personal distaste. Uh, uh, whatever your reason is for not being Catholic, we want to know what it is. You want us to call talk, call us and talk about it at one eight hundred. Five eight five nine three nine six. I want to go now to uh, is this Izzy in Indianapolis, Indiana, listening on Indy Catholic Radio FM eighty nine point one. Izzy, welcome to Call to Communion. Hi. Hey, Izzy. How, how are, are you, Dr. you, David? I'm fine. How about you? I'm doing great. What hey, kind of... I just wanted to say thank you for doing your show. I've been listening for months, and uh, the Lord has used your program to teach me so much about His Word and and about Catholic theology. So. Yes, what's I say? Thanks for what you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I got a question for you. Um, I am a, a worship leader. Uh, I work in a Protestant church, and uh, over the past year, the Lord has really been beckoning me uh, to investigate uh, the Catholic Church, and uh, it's gotten to the point where a few weeks ago I made the decision to join an RCIA class. Um, with the intention of, once April comes around, uh, joining the Catholic Church. My question is, um, and I've asked a couple people about this, but I'd just like some insight. Uh, what is the level of appropriateness, if I would join the Catholic Church, um, of continuing to minister in the Protestant Church? Um, I'm a worship leader. I know that God has called me in part to the congregation that I help lead music and worship at. But at the same time, I feel like he's, he's calling me to join the Catholic Church. And so where's the line in that? And have you seen any scenarios or circumstances where a Protestant minister has joined the Catholic Church? 
Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I really I appreciate the call a lot. And there are a lot of people in your situation in ministry in some form or fashion in a Protestant church. They they feel the need to become Catholic. So there there are a number of things going on here. All right. So first of all, you know, I, I hear that you described yourself as a worship leader, and from my experience of of Protestantism, sometimes worship leader has a slightly different connotation than you know music director. Uh, at least, you know, particularly in the more charismatic sort of churches, more casual churches, the worship leader uh, oftentimes has a very pastoral role in the congregation, almost a kind of preaching role where he sees his job as uh, kind of leading the congregation to a certain disposition, to a certain attitude, a uh, certain affectivity, to be receptive to a particular kind of sermon, a particular kind of message, and uh, very oftentimes is crafting the selection of music with a with a very didactic or catechetical purpose in mind, and if, I don't know if that's your situation, if that kind of accurately describes the way you approached your ministry. But if that's if that's the case, many times this would involve you in uh, in in promulgating doctrines that are against the Catholic faith. Now it might not, it might not, but that's that's something to consider right off the bat. That you know you don't want to you don't want to bear witness against your own conscience here. And I know, uh, you know, a lot of Protestant worship music, uh, you know, however well-intentioned and sometimes drawn from Scripture, but sometimes not. And sometimes there's an awful lot of interpretation that goes into those that leads in some distinctly uncatholic directions and unbiblical directions. And that, I think that could potentially pose a serious tr- uh, challenge to your uh, immediate conscience. Now, you know, further down the road, you have to look at the question of divided loyalties, all right? I mean, so... Uh, ultimately, God wants you to use your gifts, your musical gifts and your leadership gifts, um, but uh, the proper place to use those, of course, is within his church, all right? And and there are plenty of opportunities for music ministry within the Catholic Church. Um, and so, you know, as a as a long-term plan, I, I don't think that you would that you would probably want to stay in that position forever. Now, you know, there are, there are people who are involved ecumenically in music across denominational lines, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with playing music in a in a non-Catholic venue, uh, you know, particularly if it's if it's aimed at the glory of God. But uh, but there may be dynamics there that involve you in a kind of performative contradiction, where it, in in one level you're you're being called to bear witness to something that you don't actually believe. And uh, and that could be problematic for the conscience. So you know, long term, look look in terms of getting involved in Catholic music ministry. There are plenty of opportunities. So I mean, you know, heaven knows we need good music in the Catholic parish. And uh, so that's where I would invite you to ultimately to seek to invest yourself. I hope that's helpful. And I really appreciate the question. It's a thoughtful one. So keep on listening and keep on praying and and let us know when you've come into the church after RCA. We'd love to hear your story. So thanks again for calling. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, dial 1-205-271-2985. 1-800-585-9396. Take an email. Uh, this one is from Anonymous. Anonymous writes and says, piggybacking on an earlier caller's question, this is from a week or two ago, I think, about the thief on the cross next to Christ. If I recall correctly, Christ told the one, you will be with me this day in paradise. How do you marry that with the church's teaching on purgatory, where most of us need to go for a time of purification before going to heaven? Thank you very much, Anonymous. That's a great question. I appreciate it. So, uh, St. Dismas here is the is the, uh, the thief in question. This is the first canonized saint of the Catholic Church. This is uh, canonized by no higher authority than Christ himself. Uh, what a delightful uh, truth. So obviously, St. Dismas teaches us that not everybody needs to pass through purgatory. Um, and uh, he certainly didn't. He died and was with Christ immediately in paradise, immediately upon death. His love for Christ was so intense, his self-surrender to the mercy of God so complete, his, his, uh, his acceptance of the justice imposed upon him for his own sin, his humility uh, testifying that he that he got what his deeds deserved, and his and his heartfelt appeal for mercy to Christ, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, have mercy upon me. You know, uh, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The kind of contrition of heart, uh, the kind of love for Christ, the kind of humility that was sufficient 
uh, for him to enter directly into divine dwellings. I think St. Dismas should be a great encouragement to all of us in our spiritual life, uh, understanding how deep and wide is the love of God, the mercy of God in Christ. So nothing about the, the story of the thief on the cross does anything to defeat the teaching about purgatory or any other Catholic doctrine. In fact, it's a beautiful illustration of the power of the gospel to bring us to salvation in Christ. Thank you so much for the call. I really appreciate it. All right, the number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, dial 1-205-271-2985. All right, here is a question. Uh, it's a follow-up from one we got a, uh, a few weeks back about the internal forum. Hi, Dr. Anders. My previous question was not written well, so here's my second attempt. I was recently told by a deacon that the internal forum may be used to allow a divorced and remarried Catholic to receive communion again. He said it was rarely used. It's a process I was not aware of and just wondered if you could shed some light on it. Thanks again for your program. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. So I understand what's going on here, and I think you've been misinformed by this deacon. So... In Catholic theology, we can distinguish the external forum, which is a public forum, all right, such as a, a marriage tribunal, a court of the church, uh, from the internal forum, those, those uh, places where, where judicial rulings are made in a private place, like in the confessional or even within our own conscience. Those are internal fora, places where it, uh, the, the decision is not open to public gaze. Now, what you've been uh, told is not true. What you've been told is that the question of the validity of marriage could be determined, could be decided in a, in a completely private place, like one's conscience or in the confessional, and that there's no need to take it to the public tribunal of the church, the marriage tribunal, for a public judgment. Now, that's untrue. That's untrue because marriage is a public institution. Uh, when I marry a woman, I'm a married man. When I married my wife, suddenly she became off-limits to every other man. I became off-limits to every other woman. Our marriage is a is a social uh, institution. It has social and public ramifications, all right? And, and thus, the church has an interest in ruling on it in a public forum. And that's why the v question of the validity of marriage has to be resolved in a public forum like the marriage tribunal or uh, in the special cases that Pope Benedict has now, excuse me, that Pope Francis has now allowed can be decided by a bishop or some other competent public authority established by him. So I hope that answers your question. I appreciate it a lot. All right. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. I'm going to go to a break. When I come back, I'm going to talk to Deborah in St. Louis, Missouri, to Cowboy driving through Ohio, and to you at 1-800-585-9396. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith, 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Oblate Father Andrew Small, National Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies in the United States. She walked and walked and walked. 2,800 miles, in fact. Uwe was her name. She and her family walked those long miles to freedom 20 years ago as genocide ravaged her country and killed 800,000 of her fellow Rwandans. She's now Sister Uwe. And she told me, we still need healing, Father. She is still walking towards freedom. It's a journey of hope and a lesson from the missions. Brought to you by the Pontifical Mission Societies. To learn more about becoming a missionary right where you are, visit our website at onefamilyandmission.org. Remember, if you're baptized, you're a missionary. Through prayer and sacrifice, in word and witness, we're all part of this one family and mission. What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Welcome back to Call to Communion. I'm David Anders. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. Taking your calls about the Catholic faith and asking you a question. What is stopping you from becoming a Catholic? I want to talk to Deborah in St. Louis, Missouri, listening on Covenant Radio Network, AM 1460. Deborah, welcome to Call to Communion. Hi. Hey, how are um, you? I came, I came home into the Catholic Church three years ago. Beautiful. From 20, 20 years in Calvinism. 
and um, pretty early on in my journey, I was able to, you know, see that the Calvinist teachings on predestination election were not were not not right. But what I've not been able to find in my studies is um, what is the Catholic teaching on predestination and election. Sure, thank you so much, Deborah. I really appreciate it. And uh, if I might, uh, if I might suggest. I know a bunch of good ex-Calvinists in in St. Louis, uh, Catholic Christians that have come into full communion with the Catholic faith from the Presbyterian tradition. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with them, I would really well, urge actually, you. Actually, I went I went to seminary with some of them. So. Oh well, you probably um, know some of my very friends. Then. Well, Brian and, Brian and Brian Cross and I were classmates together. Oh, how beautiful! Well, you know, if if you know Brian, then 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 you. I know him. You, okay, very good, very good. <laughs> all right, so so the all right. The, well, if if you've been in seminary with Brian, I'm going to recommend a book to you by Father Gary Lagrange, who was a, a, a professor at the Angelicum for many many years. He actually taught. Uh, St. Pope John Paul II, and uh, uh, he has written a book called Simply Predestination, and it gives you a really, really thorough discussion discussion of the Catholic doctrine on predestination. And of course, there is a doctrine of predestination. We read about it in the scriptures. So Ephesians 1.11, for instance, says, In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So how does the Catholic faith understand that? Well, as you rightly note, the Catholic Church rejects the Calvinist notion that God foreordains, creates specifically, some people for the purpose of damning them. That's an atrocious doctrine. The Catholic Church rejects it. All right? What the Church does teach is that God uh, chooses to give uh, if efficacious grace, grace that will actually bring us uh, persevering all the way to the end to salvation. That's a gift. Well, we can't earn the gift of perseverance. We can't merit it. We certainly can't earn the, uh, the grace of justification. It's a gift from God. But he gives it to some. He doesn't give it to all. All right. And predestination means that God has determined to give the graces efficacious for salvation to those whom he knows will be saved. All right. To those whom he knows will be saved. He hasn't created anybody for damnation. But he determines to give efficacious grace, effective for salvation, to those whom he knows will be saved. Now, what the church does not define, does not define, is what is the ground of God's determination? Does God, and, and one theory, all right, this is a Catholic theory, it's not dogma, it's a Catholic theory. One Catholic theory is that God gives efficacious grace and persevering grace to those whom he foreknows, will freely cooperate with that grace. So it's not that they merit the grace of predestination. They can't, all right? It's simply that God anticipates how their free will will or will not cooperate with the grace freely given, and he makes his determination based on that foreknowledge, all right? Now, that's the Molinist view. That's the Jesuit view, all right? The Dominican view is simply, uh, according to St. Thomas, following more closely on St. Augustine, would be that God does it for his own inscrutable purposes that we can't know, all right? Uh, the Jesuits t uh, try to understand it from the point of view of human freedom, reconcile human freedom with divine, uh, with, uh, divine determination. Uh, the, the Dominicans leave the whole thing up a bit more to mystery. But in, in neither case do they affirm the Calvinist position that God before, uh, you know, before the creation of the world intended to create people for the purpose of damning them. That's completely ruled out. Again, to get further uh, uh, information, I highly recommend Father Gary Goulagrange's book, Predestination. And uh, I bet you got, Brian Cross has got some good articles on the topic at uh, calledtocommunion.com. So if you will come pay a visit to us at calledtocommunion.com, I know we have several exploring this topic in greater depth uh, by, uh, by Brian, uh, uh, Jason, and some of the other fellows from, from St. Louis that I'm sure you know. So I hope that's helpful to you, and I uh, appreciate you calling a lot. I'm going to tell Brian I talked to you. <laughs> All right. All right. Th th thank you. Thank you. The number to be on the show is 1 800 585 9396. 1 800 585 9396. I want to go, out, go now to Cowboy uh, driving through Ohio, uh, listening at an unknown station. Cowboy, welcome to Call to Communion. How are you doing? I'm doing uh, great. How about you? I'm doing wonderful, man, because I love Jesus and he loves me. Fantastic. And, 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 and I. I, I First, I want you to understand that I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical of you or anybody else out there, but I think the biggest problem, as I told the, the screener earlier, the biggest problem with, with the love of Jesus is that we have organized 
we have educated ourselves away from the potential of reaching the lost souls in this world. It, it amazes me how we are all supposed to be the bride of Christ. I hate labels. I, I detest labels. I detest putting people in groups. I think it's, it's, it's insane that we let differences of opinion, differences of interpretation separate us. It's like we're going into battle and, and, and our artillery is fighting against our own infantry. You know, and, and how can we expect the lost people of this world to look at us and say, you know, hey, those people, there's something different about them. You know, they're, they're happier, they understand something, when we have such infighting amongst ourselves. I, I told a screener earlier that my dad's a minister, my older brother's a minister, and my whole family was very, very religious growing up, and I wasn't. And, and I wasn't because I didn't want to be. I wasn't because I... I, I liked the things of the world. It, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand it. I didn't. I didn't believe it. I would tell my dad many times, Dad, I'd, I'd love to tell you I believe in God, but I don't. And I'm not going to lie. And it was a journey for me to find God. And I found God despite the church. And I don't mean that in a judgmental tone because it's not my place to judge. The Bible tells me it's not. It's only His place. But it just amazes me how how we're all supposed to to believe in one God. And, and, and love Jesus, but we make it so complicated that we that we separate each other. And, and it, it just hurts me to, to hear all this, you know, hey, these people believe this way, these people believe that way. Listen, it, it's all about the love of Jesus, period. I mean, it's, it's really simple. Jesus talked about one thing more than anything, love and forgiveness. And we're supposed to work together, not to work against each other. And I just well, kind of... I, you know, want to know your view on that? Okay, uh, I I really I really appreciate that a lot, and so I, I agree with you 100. percent All right, at least in everything that you stated, the way you said it, I agree with you 100. percent I have a feeling that we may come out of it from a different angle, but I agree with you. Christ did elevate love and forgiveness, and spoke about them more than anything else. He talked about, you know, the greatest two commandments: love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. Saint Paul, of course, in Romans 13:8 says that love. Love ultimately is the fulfillment of the law. He who loves God has been born of God, knows God, St. John writes. So if we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, we have come to know God, and his life dwells within us. And I, I couldn't agree more. Now, um, I, I would point out, however, that, that love involves uh, not just a feeling, it, it involves actual reconciliation, all right? And so Christ Christ uh, didn't just talk in an abstract way about love. He gave us concrete demands for what love looks like, not only in acts of charity, um, uh, you know, uh, gifts to the poor and, and caring for their needs and so forth, but he also set up, he set up provisions for a society of people who would come to love Christ, share in the love of Christ, and agree with one another in the worship of God in, uh, following our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Look at the teaching of our Lord. He gave us some specific rituals, for instance, that imply a corporate reality to those who believe in him. Do this in memory of me, he said, concerning the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, he said. Do this in memory of me. Or he established the apostles and gave them a special role and said, to whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain are retained. Uh, to Peter, he said, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever receives you, receives me. As the Father sends me, so I send you. And St. Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5 that uh, we are co-laborers with Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. So the, the, the reality of belief in Christ has a visible dimension that can be seen in those servants that were called by him and sent by him. And unity, union with them in a visible way is part of the gospel because the church is to be an instrument of reconciliation, not only of uh, in our thinking, but in our actual living. We're called to live in community with one another in a visible way. So John says in John chapter 17, may they all be one, Christ prays, that the world might know that, 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 that Jesus is from God. So it's got to be a kind of visible that's expressed, uh, excuse me, it's got to be kind of a unity that's expressed in a visible way that can be seen even by unbelievers, which is why St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.10, agree on everything, agree on everything. 
And Paul uh, even included within that the elements and forms of Christian worship. So when he talked about the liturgy in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, if anybody wants to be contentious, you know, if, if we're doing it one way over here and you're doing it another way over there, well, we're not in unity in our form of worship. He says, if anybody wants to be contentious, know that we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. So St. Paul pointed to the to the Catholicity of the Church, the fact that the liturgy would be celebrated one way throughout the world as a norm, as a criteria for Christian unity. All right? So we find within the teaching of Christ and the Apostles the idea that our love and unity with one another is not just simple wishy-washy good feelings, but is manifested in a public, even in a ritual and liturgical way that can be visible to the world around us. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and there's only one church. You know, and again, in Ephesians 3, St. Paul says that God's plan from all ages past was that now through the church, through the church, it's Ephesians 3, verse 9, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. In 1 Timothy 3, 15, St. Paul says, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, not in a not in a human way, a lordly way of lording it over other people and, and, and being tyrannical and so forth, but as a service of love to present the truth to all men that we're reconciled to Christ, reconciled to God in Christ, and to share that in a corporate and visible way. That's why Christ established the one Catholic Church to which we're all called to communion. Now, some people are not fully in communion with that church. They may have only elements of communion with the church. They may share elements of truth and sanctification. And as Catholics, we rejoice in that, and we're glad, and we celebrate those as our separated brethren, but we desire to bring them into an even deeper and closer communion that, with St. Paul, we might agree on everything, as Scripture tells us to do. So I hope that's helpful to you, Cowboy. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. The number to be on the show is 1-800-585-9396. We have uh, only a second left. I want to go to Teresa in Boston, Massachusetts, listening on Station of the Cross, AM 1060. Teresa, welcome to Call to Communion. Teresa, hey, you're on the show. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Good. I'm just I'm puzzled by your answer about business because um, we had taken a, a uh, catechesis course, my husband and I, uh, by a very reputable um, teacher. And one of the things he said is that uh, paradise is not necessarily heaven. It's a place where the Father was, but it didn't necessarily mean he had eternal life in heaven, that he was dismissed of all his his faults. And uh, so when you answered that, in fact, yes, he was dismissed of all his faults, I, I, got, um, I got concerned. In fact, I looked up, um, I looked it up in Catholic Answers, and he said, it says, dismissing the business case as quote-unquote paradise, the place to which business would go means, quote-unquote, the abode of the blessed dead. Now, to me, that would be, he could be, you know, he could, um, the church also teaches that some are saved and will go to purgatory. It seems to me that, I just felt better about my catechesis answer that yeah, Teresa, I'm about to run out of time. I'm going to try to get to it tomorrow. Thank you so much. The show is called Communion. <laughs>